peace. And so our, our beatitude this morning is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And so last week, uh, I was going through these beatitudes, we, we talked about, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This morning, and there's going to be some connection here, we'll see here in a bit, the words are, blessed are the, the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. If you've ever had kids, or uh, if you remember that moment when you first had your firstborn like, you had no idea what you were getting into. Uh, you, you, like, they didn't come with a manual. They didn't come with any instruction. And so uh, you found out life is coming, and so you're doing everything you can uh, to get ready. And for those that are, have been first-time parents, you, you know just the amount of anxiety that awaits the unknown of what do we need to do? What do we need to prepare for? We probably need a crib. That would be a good idea. Probably need some diapers. Even further, a good idea. Some wipes, and you're doing everything you can. You got to get the nursery ready. You got to make sure it's painted and got the, the things hanging on the walls. But then you realize when they get older, you put those things too low. You got to raise them up because they're going to be reaching and grabbing them. You got to, there's this like flurry of activity and angst awaiting your first child. And I'm, I'll never forget, we're, Chloe and I, uh, we're uh, coming back home. And, uh, and, and you know, of course, as, uh, for the woman, she feels the baby often uh, kicking. And so as, as the dude, I, I don't feel that that often because I'm not carrying the child, obviously. And so every now and then she'd reach and grab my arm and say, hey, you need, you need to feel your son, it, it, he's moving. And I hadn't felt him at that point uh, move in her belly. And so I'm just, I'm driving down the road and I, I just go ahead and just put my hand on, on her stomach. And I, I'm like, just waiting for some movement because I haven't felt anything yet. And, and, and the brother that didn't, just didn't give me like a, just a gentle kick. It was like Chuck Norris roundhouse kick through her stomach, hit my hand, scared the junk out of me. It was like a movie from Alien coming out and attacking my hand while she, the boy's still in the womb, which is a picture of foreshadowing of what he was going to be like as, uh, as, as, a, as an older uh, young child. The Lord was giving me a, a, a heads up on what is, what is to come. When you think about peace, what is the most peaceful place that you think of? When you think about peace, what is the most peaceful place that you think of? I think it was, it was, it was a, man, it was a peaceful place for my son when he was in Chloe's womb. He's floating around, doesn't even have to worry about eating. He just sits there and floats, doesn't have to open up his eyes. He's got his own water bed, not even just a water bed, just like a water womb, where he's just swimming around in, in the womb. Like, that's, a peaceful, that's a peaceful place. An even more terrifying thought that he would one day come out of that womb and enter our world. Our world is is big. And this this child, as we grow up, we we become kids, we become preteens, we become teenagers, and then we become adults. And when the older that we get, the more that we walk in wisdom, we realize we don't have this life figured out. And it's a terrifying thought without the hope of the gospel. C.S. Lewis writes this. He says, if we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in this world can satisfy... The most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Church or guests, do you know why you're here? Do you know your purpose here on earth? And do you know that you're loved and cared for by a good father who has not abandoned us? If not, if we don't believe these truths, if we don't have the hope of the gospel, we're left to wander trying to make this world our home, but we are created for another world. Just as the womb is not to be permanent, so too this life is not all that there is. And if we connect with this world beyond ourselves, there is hope. But if we don't connect with this world beyond us, we're left to despair. So our main thought this morning, our main idea, our main truth is that Jesus cares for you. He cares for you. And, as, and out of his care, he, as the ultimate peacemaker, he invites us to extend his peace to one another. But in order to, to be a peacemaker, in order to walk in the peace that is made available in Jesus, we have to identify what is false, a false peace. You see, the peace of this world attempts to, to fabricate peace by, by numbing ourselves or through escape we talked about this last week when we, we experience the craziness and the chaos of life and negative feelings start to happen within our heart. Our most natural tendency is want to escape this world into another world, whether it be sexual immorality, whether that be your phone, whether it be social media, uh, what, what, whether it be vacation. There's this temptation that this world, the message that it sends is that you've got to find peace by escape, by removing yourself which there is some truth, there is an element of some healthy retreat. Jesus himself retreated. He himself vacated. 
We ourselves this summer are going on vacation, but don't go on vacation and vacate from Jesus and leave him behind. Because when we do that, we are settling for a false peace. We are created for another world church, yet too often we settle for this one. In, the, in this connection, in this beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers. Here, look at the connection. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Church, when we quench the Holy Spirit within, we, we give room for the orphan spirit to have its way to govern our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. There's a physical orphan that we just prayed about, and we pray for depression, we pray, we pray for India, but we all are born as spiritual orphans without a hope, without a security, away from Eden, left to wander and to try to figure out this life on our own. But the hope of the gospel says that Jesus came and he intervened so that we wouldn't have to operate out of this orphan spirit. What is this, what is this orphan spirit? What's it even look like? How do you know the orphan spirit is coming out of you? It's one who lives with anxiety and one who lacks confidence. It also looks like one who is wrestling constantly with shame in condemnation. The orphan needs control of situations in other. The orphan is not teachable. The orphan is defensive when accused of error or of weakness. And the orphan spirit loves to be right. And it constantly has a critical spirit and consistently questions people's motives and struggles to trust things because this world is not safe, therefore I'm left on my own to fight for myself. But we see in Scripture God fights for us. Our Father cares for us. And the orphan, deep down at the root level, if we were to be honest with the orphan spirit within, there's this question of, does anybody really care? Does anybody really care for me? Because we're wired to want to belong. We're wired to be social. But we're, we're created to be in connection with the community of the triune God, of Father, Son, and Spirit. And we're, we're wired to connect with other people in the community of the church. Because those that are, are peacemakers, those that, are, that, that, that make peace happen, rest in their identity as a son and daughter of the king. If we don't rest in our identity as son and daughter of a king, we won't be making peace, but we will be making chaos and confusion and division. And you know, I've been really struggling this week with this passage. Some of y'all have, have received some phone calls from me <clears throat> just to be able to process what, what, what this idea of peace and peacemaking looks like. I went on a walk yesterday with my children, and as I'm walking around uh, my neighborhood, I couldn't help but take notice of the amount of flags that were out. Now, when I was growing up, there was, there was, there was only one flag that, that was hung out there, and it was the American flag. Uh, really, on the 4th of July or any <clears throat> patriotic day, the flags were out. But in our culture today, we see something differently. We see not only the American flag being hung, but we also see other flags being waved. Literally, as I'm going down my street, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a house right here that has a Black Lives Matter flag, and then literally on the other side of the street is a, is a, is a Red Lives Matter flag. And as I'm walking with my kids, I could not help but think, is there any peace available to these people in these two different camps? Is there any peace available for, for us to, to meet on, to, to, to allow us to be reconciled? We see blue lives matter. We see red lives matter. We see all lives matter. We see the LBGTQ community waving their flag of peace. Which is interesting, in our pursuit of peace, we are not experiencing peace. We're actually encountering hostility and division and confusion. Now listen, church, hear my heart. I'm not pointing the finger at them as if we're better than this. Y'all, the church can be just as guilty as pursuing peace, yet being divisive and hurtful and wounding. So how does peacemaking apply here? I, mean, I was literally this past week sent a podcast by a friend uh, from a church called Mars Hill who was led by a pastor of, uh, called Mark Driscoll and, and, and unpacks the unwinding of this church, this church that on the outside looks significant. I mean, thousands are coming to faith, being baptized, but yet inwardly amongst the leadership, there's some wounds happening, there's some unhealthiness happening, there's arrogance that's happening. And yet on the outside, it was excused because of all the success the church was doing. And years and decades uh, go by and the church folds and closes its doors. 
Because church, if we neglect the peace that's made available in, G- in Jesus and we're not honest with ourselves, we'll be just as guilty as making social justice or good things on the outside while neglecting our identity first and foremost is in Jesus who himself is our, is our peace. We can get so caught up in doing other things, of, of doing all the, the, the feeding of the poor and taking care of people and, and, and caring for the orphan, which all those are great and good things. But if we don't bring Jesus with us as we're organizing supplies, as we're going to attack poverty or we're going to depelchin or we're going to do service projects, let us not forget that we are a people of mission. Not just to use our hands, but to use our mouths in declaring hope. Isn't that what Jesus did? Jesus fed the hungry. He, he, he fed the masses, and the masses came, and Jesus, after he fed them, opened up his mouth and invited people to follow, to follow him. We see this in our world. We don't just see this uh, just in, in our world, but we also see this in Scripture, that these camps uh, were going on, these circles of, of opportunity, of division, was going on within the church, and there was these certain people uh, called the Judaizers, uh, or, or these people uh, that had Jewish roots, and they were thinking they were better than the second-class citizens called the Gentiles. And so Paul writes this book called the, uh, the Book of Galatians, and he's, he says, hey, y'all, don't get go- so caught up in, in circumcision. Don't get caught up in all these good things and miss the, miss the heart of the gospel. Because if we miss the heart of the gospel, Paul says in Galatians 1, let them be accursed. Even if an angel were to tell you a different gospel than the gospel I'm declaring to you, let them be accursed. And so we have that same temptation. But that's why uh, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, but now... In Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You who were once far off, who who, who was lost and wandering, has now been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commands expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. I know this is a cliche answer, but it is the only answer when it comes to the amount of division and disunity is that Jesus is the answer. In a world of hostility that attempts to divide and be right, Jesus breaks down those walls and ushers in a new community by his righteousness. And it is from his righteousness and his rightness is where we live. And because Jesus is right, church, we don't have to have such a lustful desire to be right. Will we rest in the righteousness of Jesus and what he has already accomplished? Or, we will, or will we attempt to fabricate or make our own righteousness based upon what we do or what we stand for? No, the dividing wall has been broken down in Jesus. He's, he's taken the two and he has brought them together as one. Church, let me ask you a question. How much of the peace you're pursuing is rooted in you being right rather than in the rightness of Jesus? Arrogance pushes people away. Humility is like glue. It enables us to actually be present where healing can take place. This is what Jesus did for us. Rather than remaining in heaven where there's perfect peace, Jesus entered a foreign land as God, fully present, humbled himself to the point of death, and rose to life so that we could be made alive. Church, where is God inviting you to surrender personal comfort or a false peace so you can join him in the reconciling work of restoring hearts to himself. It may be across the ocean to bring the gospel to the nations. Praise God. Or maybe simply across the street or across the counter at the check-in line or across the table with the server or across the playground with the parent who's with their, or who's with their kids. And as we enter into this sacred uh, space and place with people, will we engage them not with this desire to be right, But will we lay that down, humble ourselves to listen? Will we be a listening people? And as we listen to people, as we not get so defensive, as we we make ourselves available, will we ask questions? And we invite people out of their small story to be a part of Jesus' big, good, and redemption story of peace. This is the story we were made for. This is where peace is at. But we need help. We need desperate help. That's why Jesus said in John 14, oh, there's a helper that's going to come. 
and this helper is the Holy Spirit. And he will, the Father will send him in my name, and he will teach you all the things and bring to remembrance all that is I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be tr- troubled, neither let them be afraid. Our main thought, Jesus cares for you. And as our ultimate peacemaker, he invites us to expend, ex- extend his peace to one another. So church, let us not settle for a false peace, but let us pursue the peace and the lasting peace that is in Jesus. This idea of peace within, within scripture, we take a, a step outside of false peace and look in where true peace resides and is talked about. It's this idea of shalom. And it's repeated, uh, including into the New Testament with the word arene, 334 total times. I think God's trying to get, <laughs> trying to send a message for us to get of this idea of peace. And so we take all those things and look at peace as a whole. The, the Bible talks about a tranquility of the soul, a calmness, a stillness, something that was broken but is now restored and has been made whole. If you want a, pr- a definition of peace, I would define peace as this. Peace is in the presence of Jesus. And it's experienced when we entrust ourselves to him to restore that which is broken in us and in our world. True peace comes when we actually step into conflict and the pressures of life while centering ourselves on him. This is why sandwiched in between pure of heart, peacemakers, and next week we're going to talk about those who are being persecuted because, church, it's a guarantee that we will be persecuted, according to 2 Timothy 3.12. And according to Beatitudes, that blessed are those who are, who are persecuted. They're, 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 that conflict, it is inevitable. It's around the corner. We can't avoid it. But when conflict does come, will we step into it with Jesus as our peace and deal with what we need to be, deal with? Healing truth. This means that we're not in bondage to circumstance. We cannot control the outcome of events, events or people. What we can control is how we respond. Will it be faith or will it be fear? Will it be faith or will it be fear? My son recently, he's been really scared of the dark. He's three years old. Um, and uh, he's just been like, he's, I don't know if, like, whether he's manipulating me. Because you all know when you're, it's bedtime, kids get a little crazy. And they start manipul- manipulating you. And they want you to, they want to hang out longer. They, know, they, they feel like they're, they, they got some serious FOMO happening. They feel like they're missing out. Like mom and dad are partying it up. Uh, like at the middle of the night. No, we're passed out, actually. Not, not partying. We're passed out at 8 o'clock. Uh, Hopefully, sometimes, not really, that's just a dream, not eight o'clock, usually later because my son lingers, he has to go to the bathroom, I'm like, bro, can you not go to the bathroom before we put you down to bed? But these have been his words recently when we turn off the light. He says, daddy, please don't leave me. I'm scared of the dark. I'm afraid that you're going to leave. Please don't leave me. And I've been thinking about that and I think about my, my, my natural response to tell him is, son, I'm, I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to care for you. I'm literally right across the, the, the hallway. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm like right here in the home. I'm not, I'm not going to leave you. My tendency is to give uh, ultimate security to my son based upon myself as a dad. And all those things being true. But if I don't point my son to the ultimate security, the ultimate eternal security of the father, then I have failed as a parent. So in those moments, it's not about not necessarily about me, but how can I capitalize on that moment in, in pointing my, my child to the heart of the Father? And so we open up the, book, uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible, because he's three. If you have a preschooler, I highly recommend the Jesus Storybook Bible. It may fly over their head. Continue after it. Continue reading through it, because we, we stumbled across uh, when Jesus calms the storm. And I have a picture for us of uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible of when, when that storm was happening. And every time my son and I were reading this story, he laughs so hard. He thinks this is the funniest thing ever, which makes me laugh as well. And I start looking at this picture, and there's absolute chaos going on. I don't know who that brother is hanging on uh, the sail right there, but my, my point you to think that it's hilarious. And it looks like Jesus is planking uh, as, as he's sleeping. Y'all remember when planking was popular? Uh, that was the thing. So Jesus there planking. He's passed out and he's asleep because I want to give my son in those moments not a story about dad, but I want to give him a story about his eternal dad. I want to expose him to truth because I can't do it alone as a parent. We can't do it alone as a parent. We must grab hold of something outside of ourselves to center us. And in this story, get this, y'all, in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, they awoke him, Jesus, and said to him, teacher, hear this, Teacher, do you not care 
Why are we talking about the main point that Jesus cares for us? Because if we forget his care for us, we'll be succumbed to the chaos and the storm circumstantially. Jesus, do you not care that we are perishing? We're dying, Jesus. The waters are coming onto the boat because the disciples only saw the waves. And just as the waters were filling in the boat, they allowed fear to flood their heart, forgetting who was with them. Because church, if we forget that God cares, we'll be left to the orphan within to have its way. Some of us need to hear these words this morning, and I'll repeat myself, and I'm okay with repeating myself, is that God cares for you, so much so that Jesus took on the chaos of sin and death by dying himself and raising to life, so we'd spend our lives forever with him. And when we embrace this gospel truth, this in turn produces peace, that we're not at the mercy of circumstance, we're not at the mercy of uh, of allowing things, allowing things in our world to dictate the peace and the stillness and the tranquility of the soul that's made available in not self, but in the Savior. And Jesus stands up, he wakes up in verse 39, and he awoke and he rebuked the wind. He almost like, it's almost like a knock it off kind of deal. He rebuked it, so knock it off. And he said to the sea, what did he say to the sea? He said, peace, be still. And Jesus says the same thing to us when our, whole, when our souls are filled with angst. Jesus comes with words with us this morning to say, I got you. I'm here for you. I haven't forgotten about you. You're safe with me. I'm fully present. I'm for you. I'm the God who's in control of all things, and I care for you. And the Bible says the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, get the connection, he said to them, why are you so afraid have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, not of the storm, but of the Savior, of the storm that would listen to the words of its creator, because Jesus is the creator. See this in Colossians 1, we read through from the very beginning, he made all things, and the winds and the waves listen to his voice, and they submit. Church, will we listen to his voice and follow him, trusting that he has us? He's for you, you're safe with him. Will we come out of hiding to find our security and safety in him? Because in that place, we can extend peace. Jesus cares for you. And as our ultimate peacemaker, he, he invites us to extend his peace to one another. This is his peace. We talked about a false peace. We're talking about Jesus' peace. Now we're going to be talking about peacemaking. What's it look like to be a peacemaker with others? When Jesus uses the word peacemakers, its ultimate goal was for us to be reconciled to God and to one another. And so I, 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 I was told, I was approached uh, like a couple months ago uh, about uh, someone found out that I was going to be teaching on Peacemaker, and this person uh, works in the law enforcement uh, as a police officer. And, uh, and, and apparently, like this verse, blessed are the peacemakers, is a big deal uh, amongst law enforcement. Like this is the verse that they hold on to, that they champion. Uh, and, and as I was had this conversation with this individual, he began to share with me like, hey, but it's not okay. Like we're using scripture and we're, and we're using God's truth to justify certain actions that are just, just not okay. And so, so like ultimately, like God uses justice with the goal, with this peace, so that we, we'd be reconciled to God first and foremost. And then we'd be reconciled to one another. Notice Jesus said peacemakers, not peace procrastinators. Like we have to make it happen. So that means in order to experience Jesus' peace, we must die to preference and comfort. And we have to be controlled or compelled or driven or hemmed in by the love of Jesus who pursues us. And he gives us, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the ministry of reconciliation, which is peacemaking. Did y'all know y'all are called the ministry? All of us in this room. It's not the guy with the mic holding the Bible up front. If you are in Jesus, you have been given a priesthood. And part of this priesthood is the reconciling work of sinners to Jesus himself through the work of the Holy Spirit. This reconciling work, Paul says, for the love of Christ compels me because I am convinced of this, that one died, therefore all have died. Church, what do we need to die to this morning or this week so that we can not only extend the peace, but be about the peace of Jesus within amongst the storm? Because again, true peace is not when we avoid conflict, but it's when we abide in Jesus and take steps to confront issues. And when we make excuses or we procrastinate, we leave room for bitterness to be lodged in the heart and fester, thus affecting you and others and the unity of the bride. 
Now we're not talking, this is something so much bigger than just us. Now the gospel in our witness to a lost and dying world is at stake. When I was in junior high, I used to run track. And you're like, you used to run track? I know, in junior high I was a little bit smaller. Actually, a lot a bit smaller. And I used to run the 300 hurdles, and I hated it. I was awful at it. Uh, for whatever reason, I found myself there on that track, and we'd practice, and I always felt like I was going to vomit right before uh, I came out of the blocks. Every time, I had so much, so much anxiety, uh, which maybe probably would have helped uh, shed some weight before I go get on the track. But I remember getting there in the blocks, and I'm just, I'm terrified, and, and, I, and I'm getting in, and, I, and, this, and there's the gun that would be raised, which was also terrifying. Let's, hey, let's scare some kids, get them on track with their insecurity, and then let's fire a gun. Like, that's smart. I like in the blocks, and I'm getting there, and I, I'm so anxious. But when, when, that, when that gun went off, it was game on. I don't even know how my legs were working. They probably looked a little bit like, like, like this. And there would be times where I would eat it in front of everybody, which actually happened, and I would learn from it. Because church, I think we're still trying to figure out how to deal with conflict. I think there's so much room for us to deal and grow in when it comes to confronting issues in one another. The book of Hebrews talks about striving, running, about getting into the blocks and not allowing the anxiety of the unknown or how people are going to respond to dictate how we need to respond. It says strive, run swiftly, chase after it, strive for peace with everyone. Not just ones that we prefer, not just like our really good friends that we invite to the house. No, the Bible says strive for peace with everyone. Not just, not just our buddies. Well, I don't really know them that well. We don't really have that relationship. I mean, they did something, but not that really big of a deal. So I don't think it really needs to be addressed. No, here amongst the church and how we operate as, as a, um, underneath the kingdom and the king is to strive, to run. That, that y'all, I don't know how good this illustration is or what, how it is, but when I, when I was preparing today, all I could hear, all I could hear was the gun going off and Jesus is inviting us to get out of the blocks, to get out of the blocks of anxiety, to get out of the blocks of obsessing about, about fear or people. And he's inviting us to join him on the track in the game and being about his peace and extending that peace to one another. Chase after it, run after it with everyone and for the holiness of and for the wholeness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and many become defiled. Did y'all catch it? Because if we don't deal with this bitterness, this root of bitterness, then it can affect not just the few, it affects the many. And so will we dial in, will we check our hearts? Because the remaining of our time, I want, I want to just simply and practically a lot more easier said than done. I just said simply. Uh, it's, it's just it's hard work, y'all. The ministry of reconciliation takes us literally dying and being about the gospel and placing Jesus at the center. It's how do we handle conflict as ministers of reconciliation? How do you naturally handle conflict? Are you one that's ready to fight? Are you ready to one that's like, flight, I'm out of here? Or are you one that just kind of freezes? I have no idea what to do. I have no idea what to say. So I'm just going to look at you. And then I'm going to walk away, right? Which one of you is, 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 is your bent? Are you a fighter? Are you a flighter? That's not a word. Do you flight? Maybe it is. Or do you freeze? Which one of those is your natural bent? Because I want to walk us through these biblical principles. There was maybe about a year ago, a few months ago, Lance sent out a, a helpful spreadsheet that I'm referring to. I just tweaked it and adjusted it. But the question is, is how do we do this? How, how do we do this biblically? And how do we do it as a family? So I have some uh, six A's for us, and the first A is this, is to assess the issue. When an issue arises, when disappointment hits the heart, when we're offended, we need to take a, we need to take a step back. Rather than to somebody, we need to take a, a step back, pause, and pray in desperation. The Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Translation or meaning, if we, we have expectations, and when those expectations aren't met, Usually anger surfaces or bitterness surfaces. So the main question when an issue arises is to ask the question, what are my expectations here? What are my expectations? Are they rooted in preference or are they rooted in principle? Are they rooted in my own person, my own personal preference? Or are they rooted in clear violations of scripture? Was I talked about? Was I, was I gossiped about? Was I slandered about? Is there a situation of adultery? Is it a clear violation of what we see in scripture? 
And so if so, if so, then we should be pursuing a brother or sister in love to invite them into, into more and into maturity. But most of the time, when I, when I have conversations and trying to uh, handle conflict, it, it, it deals in this gray area of like the Bible specifically doesn't speak to this issue. How should I handle it? And so there's this pausing, there's this, there's this, this examining of the heart because there may be, there may be lodged in your heart a, a, a lust for approval or acceptance. And because that person didn't give you that approval or acceptance, I'm now angry. And yet, church, that, 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 that is what divides if we're not able to be honest with ourselves, examine our own heart. Because when we're offended, we ask the question, why am I offended? You know, the Pharisees were offended. They were offended with Jesus all the time. But just because you're offended doesn't mean that you're right. Will we pause? Will we dial in? Will we, will we, will we, will we show humility to one another? Second A is this, is address the issue with that person and not someone else. Address the issue with that person and not someone else because the temptation, and Lance talked about this back in October, I think, he talked about this idea of emotional triangulation when we triang- triangulate, when we have an issue with somebody, the temptation is to bring somebody else along so that we can have an emotional ally, so that we can share our feelings, they get our feelings, and our friend, she's not really a friend in this moment, because a friend would say, hey, don't have that conversation with me, you need to go have that conversation with somebody else. But rather, in this moment, we're going to other people trying to find an embrace in a, an emotional ally rather than in the embrace of Jesus and his peace. Rather than dealing with the issue ourselves, we go to somebody else to talk about the issue, to validate where we are so that we don't seek reconciliation, we seek payback. I got this brother or sister right here. I need some, some, someone to process with. Someone, man, can you pray for me? And this person say, I'm actually not going to pray. I'm actually just going to invite you to walk in what scripture has already laid out for us as followers of Jesus, go have the conversation with the other person. Because that person on the other end of the triangle, the temptation, because we like acceptance, is, oh yeah, I'm in. I'm in, yeah, yeah, I'm your friend. But the Bible says, no, faithful are the friends, uh, a a faithful friend wounds. But an unfriend or or deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. enemy. It's will we be faithful friends, will we direct people to the truth? Because faithful friends and peacemakers have conversations they naturally don't want to have, and they don't pretend like everything is okay when it's not. Will we be faithful friends? Will we be one of our values as a church as a faithful family? To be honest, to have those conversations with one another. That we'd go and be about peace and peace making because it's deceit if I sit at the table with you or I come on Sunday morning and we have a conversation and I got bitterness and resentment in my heart and I'm just smiling like all is good the Lord's good isn't he oh faithful and true blessed but no Jesus invites us into authenticity and genuineness not only in this in this room but also in our relationships and our marriages to have conversations that we need to have not to go to other people but to go to the person we have an issue with Here's the deal. There, there are some times where there's these gray areas where we need, we need wisdom. And I don't have time to get into this, but there's this moment in the Gospels where, where Jesus is going to Capernaum, and there's this conflict that arises. There's this fight that breaks out. And what are they fighting about? They're fighting about who is the greatest. you got your disciples, the main man, like the main men following Jesus, and there's this argument about, hey, man, I'm better than you. No, man, I'm better than you. No, no, no. Did you see me do that? I cast that demon out. You didn't got nothing on that demon. I own that demon. Like, you got this argument that's going on, there's this competitiveness based upon who is the greatest, which isn't that the source of conflict, thinking that we are the greatest? No, Jesus is the greatest. We will fail each other. We will, I'll just go in front and say this, there will be a point where I will fail you. I will be a point where I will mess up. That we're all in process of learning together on this journey as we tr- entrust ourselves to the one who's faithful and true and who didn't mess up. And will we humble ourselves, lay down our, uh, uh, our, our preference or our desire to be right so that we can be reconciled, so that the world can see the gospel and not us? That we have it all together and all, all figured out. But there's times where we need to be shown how to do this. And so what did Jesus do? Fight breaks out. And the, and the Bible says that the disciples remained quiet. They didn't want to talk about it. And Jesus, knowing their hearts, literally invites them into a come-to-Jesus meeting and the Bible says that they sat down. 
to have this meeting, to have this conversation, because the gospel is at stake, unity as is at stake, and, and Jesus hates division. And so if we're not united here, we got to deal with this. And we got to lay this thing down. He places a child in front of them and says, I want you to be like this child. For whoever uh, receives this child receives me, and whoever receives me receives me not but him, but him who sent me. That there, there's, and as we deal with conflict, there's training that needs to happen. There's times where, where we do need to have a trusted counselor. We do need a, a trusted peacemaker who is further down the road than us so that we can process, not, 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 not to, to, to prove that we are right, but no, to, to know how can I handle this in humility? How can I approach this person with a humble and peacemaking heart? I can't expect my son to know how to handle conflict. I can't expect that of him. I have, he has to be shown, and if we're honest, some of y'all ain't going to like this, but there's an orphan spirit that resides in us. That means that there's an inner child still remaining in us that needs to be matured and nurtured and invited into growth. We need to be shown this ultimately by Jesus himself. Ideally, we would go to someone one-on-one, but every now and then, gray issue happens. We need a trusted shepherd. We need an elder. We, we need a counselor. We talk about in our marriages, marriage counseling. We need somebody as a third party to identify the blind spots and to speak truth of where the gospel should be applied. Number three is to act on the issue as soon as possible. Don't allow time to linger. The Bible says, Jesus says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift. First be reconciled and come to terms quickly. Jesus doesn't care who is right or wrong. He is most concerned about settling the matter quickly because Jesus, as head of the church, he hates division because it derails us from mission by focusing on ourselves while the world rots. You know, he calls us to be sent out, to be, to be partnered up. If you're a partner of our church, we use that word intentionally, to be partnered up, synced up with the hope of the gospel. And there will always be an excuse, y'all. There will always be an excuse to peacemaking. The phone will go off, a kid will start crying, a notification will happen, the phone will ring, the person just left church and you're unable to spot them. Like there's always an excuse not to make peace or to pursue peace. But Jesus says not to be peace procrastinators, but to be peacemakers, that we'd actually pick up the phone call, that we'd actually use our mouths and not sing songs on Sunday as we all offer our gift at the altar. But no, true worship is when we, when we actually go be reconciled and use our mouths not to sing empty praises, but to use our mouths as an instrument of peace, to make peace. Jesus hates division. He's all about unity in him. Number four, avoid drawing hard and fast conclusions. Give the other person the benefit of the, of the doubt. The, the Bible says that, that we are to, to, to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That, I mean, that, 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 for, like, that causes us to pause again. To be, I know that there's this tendency to be angry in this moment, but why am I angry? And when we have that conversation with the other person, would we be humble enough to say, hey, you did this, I sensed this, I, I don't know your motivation, is it true? Help, help me understand, because there may be a situation where you actually are wrong, that's a possibility. And when we embrace that, we walk in humility, and this allows the other person to explain themselves, and even possibly learn something about themselves that they didn't even know that they were doing. We have this tendency amongst ourselves to say, you know what, that person, they didn't, they didn't really mean it that way. You know, that's just the way that that person is. They just, they're just kind of a straight shooter. But church, hear this. What we communicate is just as important as how we communicate. Did y'all hear that? Just what we communicate is just as important as, as how we communicate. That we can't be a jerk with the scriptures. Those were the Pharisees. And knowing our tendency, we, we, we don't know sometimes how we're coming across, and you could be used as an instrument of maturity and growth. Number five, allow for forgiveness and grace. Knowing first and foremost that you have been forgiven. When Kobe was preaching on uh, Blessed Are the Merciful, he, he had a whole bag of, of rice that he brought on stage, and it was just this illustration of, this is how much you've been forgiven of. How can you not forgive your brother for the one little flake of rice? That has offended you. When we embrace and know that we've been extended grace 
in forgiveness, it enables us to extend grace and forgiveness to one another. Number six, always do all that you can to seek reconciliation. Always do all that you can and leave it to the Lord for the rest. You see, forgiveness, it depends upon the individual. Reconciliation, it's a two-way street. It takes both parties willing to meet in the middle and own some things. If one person is unwilling to be honest, then it might be even time to say goodbye or grieve the loss of the relationship. The Bible says in Romans 12, key word, if possible, if it's even able, actually able to happen, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. So we do everything that we can. We do everything to pick up the phone. We do everything that we can to send a text, not to text back and forth, but possibly have the conversation on the phone or, hey, can I meet up with you? Will we make our efforts to be, to be reconciled, to bring in proper counsel when that is appropriate, to seek reconciliation? But the Bible leaves room and says, hey, do all that you can, but reconciliation may not take place. But it's up to us. Would we own the fact that as peacemakers, to own the ministry of reconciliation and to bring things in the light? Church, we will mess up. We will fail each other. And when this happens, we have the choice to operate out of the Holy Spirit of grace, or the other option is to operate out of the orphan spirit, which harbors bitterness and resentment. Let this not be so with us. Jesus cares for you. He cares for you, and as our ultimate peacemaker, he invites us to extend his peace to one another. Will we be about that peace? Will we operate out of this grace? Let me pray. I'll call the band up, and we'll continue to worship. God, we need your help in this. But Jesus, you as our hope and as our peace, you came and invaded this space. Not only this space, but God, you come and you are dwelling with us and in us. In order for us to to make peace happen, we have to be about your peace, which is humble and gentle. And it also is about inviting us into more and allowing your truth to convict. God, would we be about your word and would we speak truth to one another that's tailored in love? God, would we be direct, but would we also pause and make sure there's not any anger of ourselves that's wrapped up in that? God, would we pause this morning and ask the question, what are my expectations Because there's conflict happening here in this room and amongst this church in our world, but more importantly, maybe even in our own home. There may be some spouses who are sitting next to one another right now in this moment who, who are in conflict. And God, you use conflict to shape us and to mold us that left to ourselves and left to our own marriages, we are truly without hope and in despair. But God, you came and you stepped in because you care. And so, God, would we operate out of your peace rather than this false peace that we can easily cave to? We need your help. That's why we have your Holy Spirit. Would you help us? In your name I pray. Amen.